Today, I'm going into um, presence, power and purpose again. This is part of our, uh, our life group series, if you like, on Acts. But what I'm going to preach today, you won't, you'll only find a little bit of in the life group that we do this week because God's given me a specific message. Um, so I'm just going to pray and we're going to get into this. And uh, thank you, Lord, that... When you release your word, it is like fire and it is like a hammer. And I just thank you, Father God, that when your word comes, it is there to break through. It is there to burn off. It is there to transform. It is there to uh, bring us into a deeper relationship with you. And all the different facets of relationship with you, Lord, are what you desire for us. So I thank you, Father God, that as you have determined in your heart that we would come into the fullness of the stature of Jesus, that, Lord, this aspect of what you want us to receive today would come and shatter our hard hearts, would come and burn away dross, would come and bring us into that place where we stand in awe of a holy God in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in the book of Acts, we see on page after page the presence of God upon his people. We see the power of God expressed in healings, signs and wonders and miracles. And we see the purpose of God released as the sphere of influence of that original 120 who were in the upper room is magnified, multiplied into thousands of people in months, three months, 5,000 men. That's revival, amen? The original blueprint for revival. And there is an aspect of the outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord at Pentecost that doesn't get enough attention today. And it's something that in large part is missing from the modern church. So we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord. And before examining what that looked like at Pentecost, I'm going to go back and trace the concept through the Old Testament through into the New. And you're going to see that the fear of God is a little bit different to what we may have imagined in the past. So it's like a thread, if you like, that runs through the entire fabric of the Word of God from beginning to end. So let me launch into this with a question that's straight out of one of David's Psalms. Have you learned the fear of the Lord? Have you learned the fear of the Lord? Everyone's too scared to answer. <laughs> Have you learned the fear of the Lord? Psalm 34, 11, David says, Come you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And David is a person who understood that the fear of God trumps the fear of man. And he was a man who, in the midst of being pursued by the anointed king of Israel in pursuit of his life, when he had the opportunity to strike dead the person who, had, uh, who was trying to kill him, he refused to do so. Because he knew that the anointing was still upon that man to be king until God says different. And so he had this understanding that he was not going to take matters into his own hands because he feared God more than man. And when he says, I will teach you the fear of the Lord, he is actually speaking out something that goes back to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going Old Testament to start with, and I promise you we're going to end up in the book of Acts. And when we get there, you're going to have a fresh revelation of what it means to truly fear God. Is that a good thing? Yeah. It is a good thing because David says, come on, come and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So in Deuteronomy 4, 9 to 10, Moses is speaking to the children of Israel and he's talking about um, what they need to do when they come into their promise. 
He says, Deuteronomy 4 verse 9, Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb. Now, we should know that Horeb is Mount Sinai, you know, with the thunder and the lightning and the earthquake and everything. When the Lord said to me, gather the people to me and I will let them hear my words. And then the Lord says that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the, on the earth and that they may teach their children. This is what David was referencing. This David who had a prophetic understanding of grace beyond just about anybody else in the Old Testament. Here's David saying, come to me children. I want to teach you the fear of the Lord because you need it. What actually happened in that encounter that he's talking about in Deuteronomy? When, the, when Israel were at Mount Sinai, where there was the thunder, there was the fire on top of the mountain, there was the cloud, there was the glory, there was the earthquake. Everyone was too scared to come close, except Moses, who's a picture of us, goes up into the glory. It says, Deuteronomy 4, 11, Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven. Who knows where the midst of heaven is? It's a long way up. This is something that was supernaturally, it was naturally supernatural. The mountain burned with fire to the midst of heaven with darkness and cloud and thick darkness. And the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but you saw no form. You only heard a voice. And out of that encounter came the covenant of the law and in particular the Ten Commandments God's righteous standard for covenant relationship with him. In fact, it goes on to say that, that as a result of all this um, encounter with God at Mount Sinai, verse 13, so he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them in the land which you cross over to possess. Now, so far, we're 100% Old Covenant, right? So far, we're in the Old Covenant. But please... Don't let anybody tell you that the Ten Commandments are just an Old Testament thing. Those Ten Commandments, the principles behind every single one of those Ten Commandments are just as valid today as they were then. God's standards don't change. If you lie, you will pay the price for it. If you steal, you will pay the price for it. If you murder, you will pay a price for it. If you commit adultery, you will pay a price for it. If you indulge in fornication, you will pay a price for it. If you practice idolatry, you will pay a price for it. And if you're looking for Scripture in the New Testament that supports it, I'll just give you one verse, Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Who here has sowed to the flesh and reaped a bad harvest? Anybody? <laughs> the rest of you probably need a fresh revelation and you're going to get one today as we move into the fear of the Lord. When we sow to the flesh, we reap of the flesh. You know, I've got a whole bunch of reasons that I used to carry around with me, excuses and justifications for my bad behavior, especially when I was younger and I got lost in drug addiction. But can I tell you that nobody ever held me down and stuck a needle in my arm. I did that myself. And I made choices after that, which Kimmy spoke about so eloquently on Friday night. I made choices after that to reinforce something that I was indulging in the flesh. I was sowing to the flesh. I sowed into addiction and I reaped addiction. My short-term gain turned into a whole lot of long-term pain. But God, being a God of grace, comes and he gets hold of you and he gives you the opportunity to step away from what you've done in your past life and begin sowing to the Spirit. How do you sow to the Spirit? You come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
There is no other way to step out of who you used to be into who God has called you to be, except through the blood covenant of Jesus. So I ask you this question, what is the fear of the Lord? Is it respect? Is it reverence? Is it awe? Yes. <laughs> and more. We're going to go a little deeper today. We're going to go into the book of Isaiah, into a scripture that... Uh, I'd never actually paid as much attention to as it deserves. In Isaiah chapter 8, verses 13 to 14, Isaiah talks about the Lord. And if you have a New King James Bible, when it says the Lord at the start of verse 13, you'll see that Lord is capitalized, which means that he's talking about the God of creation. He's talking about the, the God of the King of angels. He's talking about the creator of the entire universe. And in verse 13, it says, The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Then it says, Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Hallow means, you know, we go, hallowed be your name. Hallow means to treat as sacred or holy, to honour and dedicate yourself to that whom you, the, the person whom you are hallowing, God. Fear encompasses the concepts of fear, terror, reverence, and all. Now, isn't that enough? Not to Isaiah, because he says, let him be your dread. And dread is to be terrified, to tremble, to shake terribly, and to be completely undone in the presence of a holy God. And I'm going to take you to an instance of that. We're going to see instances of this, but one in particular in the book of Acts where somebody has an encounter with the risen Lord and he is brought into that place of dread. Now, some of us might think, oh, well, you know, it's talking about, it's, it's talking about God and, and God as an overall, you know, creator of the universe. And sometimes when we read scriptures like this, it helps our fallen nature to depersonalize the person that we're speaking about. But I want to take you to verse 14 because Isaiah says, The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And then he says, he, that's the one that you're supposed to fear, the one you're supposed to dread, the one that you're supposed to hallow, he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So who is he that you are supposed to hallow and fear and dread? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. In this scripture, it's Jesus. And for those of you who are uncomfortable with this, and we should be uncomfortable. <laughs> Forget about being comfortable, church. We need to have that place of being comfortable in our uncomfortableness. Ness, 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 which is not a word. But Jesus himself reinforces this truth in Luke 20, 17. Paul says it in Romans 9, 33. And Peter said it in 1 Peter 2, 7 to 8. In other words, those three passages look straight back to Isaiah uh, chapter 8, verse 14, and refer to the person to be hallowed, feared, and dreaded is Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 7, 8, Therefore to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense which is Isaiah 8, 14. Do you see here that there is an aspect of relationship with Jesus, who is part of the triune Godhead, that we need to get a hold of? 
that he's not just your buddy to turn to when things are going wrong. He's not just uh, the person who heaps favour upon you and blesses you and multiplies what you have. He is the person who we come before with a sense of reverence, awe, fear, terror and dread in certain situations. I'm going to prove it to you. Don't worry. Acts. So we've spent a fair bit of time in the Old Testament and yet I've said that this message is taking us out of the Old Testament into the New and into the book of Acts. I'm just setting you up because the New Testament reinforces in several instances what I've said so far. We're going to go to, uh, we're going to turn to Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that a good thing to do? Turn to Jesus. There's a lot of confused faces in the house this morning. Don't worry, I'm going somewhere with this. Mark 4, 39, 41. This is the story when the disciples, Jesus has got in the boat with his disciples and he's gone, we're going over to the other side. So they jump in the boat, they start going across and lo and behold, there's this incredible storm that springs up. Incredible storm. And these disciples who are seasoned fishermen are so frightened by what they are experiencing in the natural around them that they start turning to Jesus and saying, don't you care that we're perishing? And meanwhile, Jesus is in the bottom of the boat asleep at perfect peace. And then in Mark 4, 39, it's, it says that he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. For me, those three words are the most profound words I ever heard in my entire life. Because when I finally stepped out of my rebellion from God and came to the feet of Jesus and began to confess my sin and began to ask him to come and do what my broken do whatever he wanted to do with what my broken life had become. And I felt such agony of soul. I felt such, uh, such a storm around me. And in the place where I was, in my parents' house, I was about to, to get up and go, you know what, I think God, even God himself doesn't want anything to do with me. So great was the weight of sin upon my life. So great was the shame and the condemnation and all the rest of it. I, just, I, I didn't care whether I lived or died anymore. And I was like, in my heart, I was like, even God doesn't want me. And I was about to get up out of my seat and walk out of that place. And Jesus spoke to me and he said, peace, be still. The clearest three words I ever heard in my entire life. And it wasn't just the voice that undid me. It was what the voice did. Because when he spoke, my storm was calmed. And I knew what it was like to be at peace with God. There's no point fighting against God. He's bigger than you. So in Mark 4, and, and the funny thing is, Jesus knew that all that time in, in Sunday school, all those years in church till I was 14, he knew I would remember exactly what that was about. And so the same words that he used to calm the storm on the Sea of Galilee with those seasoned fishermen in terror, he used the same three words to speak into the depths of my soul and bring instant transformation from death to life. But I want you to see something here. Mark 4.39, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Actually, he probably just said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, now he turns to the disciples, and he says to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, and then he turned to his disciples and rebuked their fear of what was going on around them. What did that produce? Verse 41 and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They feared exceedingly. He's just got up and he's rebuked the wind and the waves, right? And the, and the storm became calm. And then he turns to his disciples and he says, Why were you afraid? 
And when the, well, after he says that, they come into an even greater fear. They feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey them? If Jesus did not want them to fear him like they had feared the storm, why didn't he rebuke them for that as well? Do you see that there is a place in the disciples' life for the fear of the Lord? For a holy fear of a God who is gracious enough to come and take us out of every rotten circumstance in our lives. If you truly fear God as he deserves to be feared, you will fear nothing else. A bit more Jesus, <laughs> and then we'll hit the book of Acts. Matthew 10, 27 to 28. Jesus talking again, Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We're in the New Testament, church. I'm quoting Jesus. And please, if someone has been trying to sell you the idea that there is no eternal hell, I've seen this popping up on social media and all over the place recently. If you're confused about this subject at all, Come and see me afterwards and I will point you to the greatest single sermon I've ever heard on the topic of hell by um, a man named Robert Morris. And uh, it will give you great clarity. Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. As we move into the book of Acts now, I believe without a revelation of the fear of the Lord, our understanding of what actually happened in the book of Acts will be stunted and incomplete. In fact, one of the main manifestations that accompanied the outpouring was the fear of the Lord, not just initially, but throughout the book of Acts, throughout the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at four encounters with the fear of the Lord that are in the book of Acts. Remember, we are working our way over the next probably 12 months through the book of Acts. And I'm not, I'm not um, you know, in the life groups, we're taking it two chapters at a time. But I felt like God was asking me to draw this concept out of the, entire, the entirety of the book of Acts so that we would have an understanding that the fear of the Lord needs to have a very central place in our lives. So um, in Acts 2, which we've already covered, there is this amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the, the disciples pour out onto the street and they're praying and prophesying in tongues and people are hearing them in their own languages. <clears throat> and Peter gets up and preaches for less than three minutes and 3,000 devout Jews come to the Lord out of that one two-minute 45 second sermon and there's this incredible revival is launched just uh, a matter of weeks after um, the inhabitants of that same city had crucified Jesus and put him to death. In Acts 2.43, uh, right after those people are crying out, what must we do to be saved? It says, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. There is a place for the fear of the Lord in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I've had a vision in this church, set in this church, where we had just finished our worship. I had just put down my guitar. I was coming down the front to say something. 
And the presence of God invaded this place, manifested himself in such glory that nobody could say a word and everybody hit the floor in awe and terror because of the awesome sense of the presence of God in this place. And I knew why people were hitting the floor because in the vision I had this inescapable sense that if I did not hit the floor, I was going to be destroyed by his presence. So strongly was it manifested. Is there room in your theology for the fear of the Lord? Do you walk in the fear of the Lord? Everybody's very quiet. Do you walk in the fear of the Lord? Do you understand the fear of the Lord? Do you understand what it's supposed to do in your heart? Do you understand the balance that it's got to bring? And from that starting point, those 3,000 coming to the Lord in the city where they had murdered the one now being worshipped as the Christ... From that scripture, we see that the fear of the Lord was a catalyst, an accompaniment for the signs and wonders that followed. And we'll see that more than once. The the fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. But the fear of the Lord didn't stop there. If I was just saying to you, oh, we need to really fear God because of this thing that happened when the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, I would be unbalanced, but I see it throughout the book of Acts and you're going to see in the final text that I share with you that it it is meant to be an integral part of revival. Encounter number two, encounter number one was the streets where fear came upon every soul because of what was happening in the outpouring. In the second uh, encounter, we're talking about Ananias and Sapphira. We're going to Acts 5 verses 1 to 16. And so in the midst of all this outpouring, um, the people are coming together. They're sharing their possessions. They're being generous with one another. They're building the ecclesia. Uh, They're they're breaking bread together daily. They're going to the temple daily. There's this outpouring, this sense of community, this sense of family and everything. And then it it says, Acts 5, 1 to 16, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. This is a word of knowledge, correct? This is a word of knowledge. This guy's come in front of all the people in the middle of this outpouring and laid this offering at the apostles' feet and said, Oh, here's the, here's the proceeds from the sale of our house. Then Ananias... I'm just going to say what Peter said one more time. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The word of knowledge, right? But look at the result. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. He dropped dead. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. When we look at this, firstly, let's not apply our own ideas to this text. Did Peter, in what he said, sentence Ananias to death? Does it say God killed Ananias? Does it say Peter judged and sentenced Ananias?
Let me point out how lightly Ananias esteemed the presence of God. We've already seen that the fear of the Lord was a feature of Pentecost. The fear of the Lord and the infilling, overflow of the Holy Spirit was inspiring people into places that they had never been before, of generosity, of walking in the Spirit. For the first time, men and women knew what it was like to be filled with the Spirit of God instead of just go to a building and hear about Him. If Ananias had said, Peter, I sold this house for a million, I'm going to give you a half. No problem. It was in his control. But somehow he and his wife talked themselves into deceiving those around them in an atmosphere of holiness, and they took the presence of God so lightly that in that atmosphere of revival, they thought that they could come and bring this impure offering with no consequences. And I believe, this is my personal belief, I've heard Ananias and Sapphira argued from so many theological arguments, points of view, perspectives that I've lost count. I watched two pastors go head to head on it for about half an hour and they were no closer to a resolution at the end than they were at the start. So I'm just going to tell you what I believe happened here. I believe the terror that fell on Ananias as he was exposed for his sin before a holy God is what killed him. And all those present had a fresh revelation of the fear of the Lord. It goes on in the story to say it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Another word of knowledge. He knew what was going to happen because he saw what happened to her husband. And they were one spirit. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Is this your picture of revival? Do we need to establish <laughs> a cemetery outside the doors of our church so when revival hits and people come with their lies and their obfuscations and their justifications and excuses and all the rest of it, I've got to have a couple of big boys <laughs> like Michael out there and Andrew over here carrying corpses out of the church and burying them. Do you think that's what God has for us? I don't believe so. But it's here as our admonition. It's here to tell us that there is a place for the fear of the Lord in our lives. And right after that scripture, immediately she fell down at his feet, breathed her last. The young men came in and took her out and buried her. It says in verse 11, So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Now Ananias drops dead and all the people in the meeting have this outpouring of the fear of the Lord upon them, as you would, right? But when the second one happens, and as the word begins to spread, the entire ecclesia of the Lord in the book of Acts fell under the fear of the Lord, and not just them, but all who heard the testimony. And once again, we see the fear of the Lord linked to signs and wonders. Because in the very next verse, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Nobody was daring to step out of line because of the fear of the Lord. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. I would suggest to you that what that verse means is that those living in compromise didn't want to take the risk of being exposed and having happened to them what had already happened to Ananias and Sapphira. But the people of Jerusalem regarded the ecclesia with great favour. 
And only those with hardened hearts opposed to the gospel maintained their opposition. That's the religious. Now look what happens next. Verse 14, believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. This is my favourite ever Randy Clark quote. If your shadow is not healing the sick, there is more. <laughs> I've heard him, uh, we, we've been in a few Randy Clark meetings and that's my favourite quote. If your shadow is not healing the sick, there is more for you to experience in the Lord. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. This is the gold standard for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And do you see that so far, three specific times, the fear, of the fear of the Lord has been accompanied by signs and wonders and increase. We're talking New Testament church. Where else do we see the fear of the Lord in the book of Acts? And I would say it's not just the fear of the Lord. This is the dread and this is the terror manifested in somebody's life. We're going to go to encounter three. It's Saul on the road to Damascus. <laughs> Acts 9, 3 to 6. This is Saul. Now, this guy is on a journey of destruction. He has an appetite for destruction. <laughs> and his appetite for destruction is to be at the expense of those who love Jesus. And he thinks he's doing God a favor. He thinks he's on God's side by killing people who have a wrong understanding of this is how you have a relationship with God. And so he's on his way to Damascus and he's been commissioned by the rulers of the Jewish people to find Christians, to imprison them and to sentence them to death if necessary. He stood by while Stephen experienced an open heaven. He stood by while people were picking up rocks and stoned this righteous man of God and he stood there approving of what was going on. This guy had the religious spirit like nobody else in the New Testament. This guy was so in Infested by the religious spirit that it turned his heart toward murder of those whom we would call brothers and sisters. That same spirit is alive and well in the world today. And so in Acts 9, starting at verse 3, it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Do you know what a goad is? It's like a rod that they use to make sure the donkey keeps going. So the picture is of a donkey kicking up his heels, trying to get rid of the person who's belting him with the rod. Jesus is calm to bring him into a place of transformation. And he's, trying to, he's been trying to get hold of him for a while, I would suggest to you. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So then he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. There is no way around the choice of words in verse 6. He, trembling and astonished. Paul's encounter with Jesus produced terror and it produced dread. He was standing in front of a holy Jesus who, whom one day we will all stand before and give an account of our lives. We'll give an account for everything that we've done and we'll stand before him. Paul had an encounter with Jesus that completely undone, undid every wrong understanding he had of God in an instant. 
And his instant response was, Lord, what do you want me to do? See how an encounter with the fear of the Lord can transform your life? An encounter with the fear of the Lord does something that nothing else will. Because then when you read scriptures like be holy as he is holy. When, you have an, when you've had an encounter with a holy God, let me tell you, there's weight attached to what you have revealed to you. One more encounter. The fourth encounter with the fear of the Lord. And this one came about because of the deliverance ministry of the early church. And this is the story of the sons of Sceva. It's found in Acts 19, 11 to 20. And you know, these encounters, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of dig into more in the life groups. And there's, there's plenty, plenty more uh, that God wants to reveal to us through these encounters. But in this one, Acts 19, starting at verse 11, um, it says that now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. That's a pretty profound anointing right there. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. They don't know Jesus. They've heard of him. Oh, we're just going to use this name with some authority because they get paid for being exorcists. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest. So this is a guy with huge authority. These seven sons who did so also, and the evil spirit answered and said to them, Jesus I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? <laughs> what did you say your name was again? <laughs> then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, seven of them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So not only do we need to have Grave diggers handy in church. We probably need a few spare sets of clothes. <laughs> just kidding. Because we don't just know about Jesus. We know Jesus. Can I share a, a testimony with you about what knowing Jesus gives you in deliverance ministry? Do you all know that you're called to deliverance ministry? Get ready for the phone calls. <laughs> Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Who did Jesus speak that to? Everybody he sent out to do his work. And it wasn't just the first 12, there's another 72 afterwards, and then another bunch after that, all the way through the book of Acts. This is what the church did. They kicked out demons. In fact, the expectation of the early church was that whenever they baptized someone, when they came out of the waters of baptism, that person would be immediately delivered of every evil spirit that they carried and that they would receive healing and that they would come out prophesying and speaking in tongues. This is the sort of revival that we need that reaches right into water baptism. Amen? Let me tell you, there's a few years ago, quite a few years ago, there was a young man who was uh, part of our church and I got a phone call because uh, in one of the neighbouring suburbs here, this guy was going crazy, absolutely crazy. He was breaking stuff, he was abusing people, he was carrying on. And uh, so I got a call to go over there. And so here he is um, outside uh, this particular house. And um, let's call him Fred. <laughs> no, um, Let's call him Michael, okay? Not you, not you, bro. Oh, just, just clarify, it wasn't him. <laughs> Let's call him Michael. I said, Michael, what are you doing? And he looked at me and he was demonized. And you could, you could see the evil in his eyes. Most of him was kind of missing. It was, he was just 
possessed or I would say oppressed to the point of possession. And uh, so right there in the middle of the street, I began to pray for him. And at first his head went down and he bowed his head. And uh, <laughs> then his head came up and he looked at me and he's, I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like, you don't have the authority here. I'm going to kill you. And he was like, like there, there was, he's like, if you've ever experienced it, you don't forget it in a hurry. And I looked at him and I said, you do not have any authority here. I'm here in the authority of the blood of Jesus and you are getting out of this man today. And with that, he took off down the street. When I say took off, I, you would have to go to, you know, in state of origin last week, Josh Adokar was clocked at 36 kilometres per hour, top speed of any NRL player. I'm telling you, this guy would have eaten him for breakfast. He took, I've never seen anybody so, move so quickly in my entire life. And he, he went flying down this street, running as fast as he could. And he jumped over a, like a low fence into the front garden of the last house in the street. And uh, on the other side, the fence was about at least that high, and he leaped the fence. I've never, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> and so, um, see, when you know Jesus, you've got to understand that the authority that you carry is because of who you know. And you might feel like, Oh, I'm not holy enough. I'm not perfect enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not the other. But those disciples that Jesus sent out and said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers and cast out demons, they weren't even saved. They were hanging out with Jesus. They weren't even saved yet. But they knew him. And if you know Jesus, you carry more than you think you do. And so the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I'm glad I prevailed in this particular encounter with a demonic. Then verse 17, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. Ephesus, the most demonized city in the ancient world at that time, the place where even pagan philosophers wanted to scrape the you-know-what off their shoes as they left because the place was so befouled by the demonic. In this place where demons were worshipped, great fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Which begs the question, when was the last time any of us got up in church and publicly repented of our sins? Not just hard attitudes, but sinful deeds. That aircon's really loud. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Do you see that encountering God in such a way where God's Spirit is poured out in power? Has the power to transform entire cities. Many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now, it's easy for us to gloss over the 50,000 pieces of silver, but when I researched it, one piece of silver was the equivalent of a day's wage, and there was 50,000 days' wages represented there, which means that people brought $7.5 million worth of uh, new Age, Witchcraft, Satanic Practice, Demon Worship and Idolatry and burned the lot of them. When we say 
the fear of the Lord, what are we actually talking about? We're not just talking about a vague concept of reverence. The word fear used in all of these New Testament passages in Greek is phobos, from which we get phobia, right? Which encompasses terror, dread, alarm, and fright. Not just some vague respect or reverence. Can I tell you that the encounter that brought me to the Lord when God gave me a revelation of my own sin birthed something of the fear of the Lord in me because I had a revelation that if I did not get right with God, I was going to hell. And the idea terrified me and put me in awe of a God who showed me my sin so that I would not have to pay the ultimate price for it. That, my friends, is grace. He did for me what I could not do for myself. He did for you what you cannot do for yourself. Make you right with a holy God. This fear of the Lord is a recurring theme throughout the book of Acts. And in these four instances, we see some common threads. Firstly, that signs and wonders accompanied the fear of the Lord. And secondly, that the fear of the Lord that fell upon these places produced a harvest. There is one more aspect of this that deserves our attention because there is actually a passage in the book of Acts that tells us that this concept of the fear of the Lord is not just a specific manifestation at a specific time in a specific place like these four instances I've just shared with you could be looked at like. They were not isolated instances where the fear of the Lord fell as a specific manifestation among the people. The church in the book of Acts actually walked in the fear of the Lord. Acts 9.31 this is at a time when the church was growing and revival was breaking out and the revival had reached as far as throughout all Judea, throughout all the Galilee area and all of Samaria. It says in Acts 9.31, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord... And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. They walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The two go together. Because on one hand, you have this um, holy awe, dread and reverence that the God who actually pronounced sentence of death upon you because of your sin, has actually come with the spirit of comfort to write upon your heart the truth that that price has been paid. And so we walk in this aspect of our lives where we do not want to offend the Spirit of grace. We do not want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We do not want to quench the Holy Spirit. And so they walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Our problem is that the modern church excels in comfort. We love to be comforted and we love to be comfortable. But I would suggest to you that for much of us, for many of us, we've lost the entire concept of the fear of the Lord. That when we consider what we might be doing today or tomorrow, when we harbour in our hearts an idea where once we start contemplating it actually becomes sin... See, if, if the fear of the Lord is an enduring revelation to me, when the temptation comes, there will be a check in my spirit 
that actually means something, that actually stops me in my tracks. And I know that in that moment, when I am so sorely tempted, if I will cry out to God and say, God, pour out your grace upon me, Come and visit upon me so that I do not walk in this sin, so that I can walk away from that which wants to cripple me. That God is faithful and he comes and he does something in our lives. We cry out, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. Lord, send you glory. Do we know what we're asking for? Do we understand that it's not just going to be a series of warm, fuzzy feelings? Do we understand that when the King of Glory comes, He comes to deal with the things in our heart that are yet undealt with? And we are right to say, Lord, rend the heavens and come down. King of Glory, come and invade. Lord, come and do what you need to do in my life. But I tell you what, when He comes, it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable. I have not had one comfortable year since I gave my life to Jesus. (laughs) I have not had one comfortable year since I gave my life to Jesus. And he doesn't need to do any more work in me than he needs to do in you, can I just suggest. (laughs) And in that uncomfortableness <laughs> is the place of transformation. Because then I'm presented with a series of choices like Kim was preaching about on Friday night. Whenever we step into sin, it's because we chose to do it. Stop making excuses for the things that you actually have the ability to make a choice about. I'm preaching that to myself. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Can you receive of this this morning? Can I have the worship team up, please? God gave me something specific to prophesy over our church this morning as I waited on him yesterday afternoon. I felt like the Lord was showing me that the easiest way to examine whether you're actually walking in the fear of the Lord is to examine the degree to which you compromise in your life. Because compromise is a revelation. This is what I heard the Lord say. Do not allow compromise to be found within you. Compromise means coming into partial agreement with your enemy. Who wants to make a deal with the devil? Anybody here? (laughs) Compromise means you agree with some of what your enemy is proposing to you. It'll be okay. (laughs) God won't see what I'm doing. Compromise means allowing an open door for the enemy to come and go at will. Do you see that? Open the door. Thank you, I'm coming in. Oh, you want me to leave now? But you've been inviting me and inviting me and inviting me. I don't think you can even shut the door anymore. Compromise means allowing an open door for him to come and go at will. Compromise will be uncovered and will cost you dearly. This is what God is speaking to us. Compromise is the enemy of sanctification. 
Compromise is the enemy of the Holy Spirit. I will have a bride who is pure and spotless, not because of her own works, but because she has allowed the work of the cross to be made complete in every area of her life. Isn't that what we want? The blood of my son was not just shed for the forgiveness of sins, but for the cleansing from all unrighteousness. It's the promise of God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and beyond that, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you've been cleansed from unrighteousness, that means the stronghold has been removed. It's been cleansed from you. Allow me to come and cleanse every area. And then I heard the Lord say, walking in the fear of the Lord is your shield from compromise. The fear of the Lord is part of your inheritance in the Lord. Embrace it, receive it, and be at peace in a world filled with anxiety and fear of circumstances. If you truly fear the Lord, you will never fear anything or anybody else. Because the fear of the Lord, the revelation of the fear of the Lord, inspires us to walk in holiness. And we are called to holiness. Without holiness, the church has nothing to offer. We're going to go into a time of worship where I, I just invite you, church. There's been so many situations over the last year where God has uncovered compromises. Where God has uncovered the state of our hearts. And God truly desires that we don't just walk in revival, but that we host His presence in such a way that revival pours out from these doors. I don't want compromise being poured out on the streets of our city. The Lord does not want compromise poured out on the streets of our city. I know there's uh, quite a large number of people watching our live stream on YouTube this morning. And so I want to pray for you first before we close the live stream and allow the Holy Spirit to come and do what He needs to do. But I just prophesy over you right now that you are an uncommon people that you are a people separated from your past and separated to the purposes of the Lord. I prophesy over you that you will walk in purity and holiness such as you have scarcely even dared to imagine. I thank you, Father God, that right now in the power of the Holy Spirit, there is a spirit of burning that is coming upon those on the live stream. And that spirit of burning is burning away the superficial stuff and it's revealing what's underneath. And that as those of you come into that place of repentance, which is truly saying, God, come and do for me what I cannot do for myself because I recognize I cannot change myself. That's the heart of repentance. God honors that prayer. And I know that God is dealing with your hearts now. You are an uncommon people. You are a unique people. You are a people separated to the purposes of God. And I declare and prophesy and decree over you that you are in an accelerated process of transformation so that you can truly not just carry but host the glory of God in a way that everybody around you can see. 
Thank you, Lord. Can we stand, church?